My name's Ronald Dorman, and I'm a proud member of CHDS Master's Class 170304. For the next few minutes, I want to tell you a short story about a good question. It's a tale about the way our organizations choose leaders, why we're consistently bad at it, and a series of simple, concrete ways we can do it better. The literature that supports this exploration is huge, and I couldn't present even a small part of it in the time we have. So my goal here is to sketch a simple map of where I started and the wind-blown course I traveled to an unexpected destination. My hope is to spark your curiosity and see where it takes you. The story starts with leadership because that's where I started. I knew it was going to be my research topic because it filled me with equal parts fascination and frustration and so many questions. My thesis focused on the Department of Homeland Security because that's where I work, but I think you'll find it's applicable to most organizations. For years, the chief criticism leveled at DHS by outsiders was the quality of its leaders. It was the topic of scaling reports by Congress, the GAO, OIG, think tanks, and others. To its credit, DHS responded by launching multiple studies. They created steering committees and focus groups, conducted internal surveys, and solicited feedback from employees across the country to try and understand the problem. They analyzed the output of their research and publicly reported their findings. We have a leadership problem. DHS immediately made big investments aimed at improving leadership at all levels by focusing on the development of existing leaders with increased training and mentorship. That all culminated in 2017 with the announcement of a DHS leadership year to promote awareness about development resources and the critical role leadership plays in mission success. Can you see anything missing from that strategy? What about the leadership selection process? We were exerting a lot of effort and resources to try and fix the leaders we had, while at the same time completely ignoring the process that selected them in the first place. Why is that? You ever hear the one about the guy looking for his keys under the streetlight? Not because he lost them there, but because it's the only place he could see? <laughs> Hold that thought. So, what's wrong with the status quo? And why should you even care? Strong leaders are essential for organizational success, and some candidates are better than others. If that weren't true, agencies and corporations would skip the time and expense of a formal selection process and just choose their leaders by rolling dice or drawing straws. The irony is, that might be exactly what most organizations are doing right now. The status quo selection process essentially relies on self-representations made by candidates in the form of resumes, responses to knowledge, skill, and achievement questionnaires and oral interviews. In effect, selection decisions are based on storytelling, or how convincingly candidates can portray ideal versions of themselves to experts, and the ability of experts to identify the best candidate for a leadership position when they see one. The problem is, the evidence to support the belief that experts can successfully identify leaders is not good. Leadership selection is a complex task, and experts are horrible at complex tasks. The status quo process also fails to compare predictions with outcomes. That means after a promotion decision is made, no one can answer a really important question. Was that a good decision? Without an answer to that question, it's impossible to assess the performance of the selection process to find mistakes, make corrections, and produce better subsequent decisions. Systems that don't compare expected outcomes with actual outcomes are called open data loops. Just like an assembly line that ends in a dark room, they repeat the same process over and over, with no way to identify problems or improve performance. They do not produce good results. Finally, with no inoculative safeguards in place, status quo processes are petri dishes for the cognitive biases and flawed heuristics that disproportionately plague experts, allowing them to fester and flourish. Alright, so let's assume for a minute that the leadership selection process is flawed and could be improved. Improved how? Leadership selection is a prediction. It's an educated but imperfect best guess about how a candidate observed today will perform tomorrow. 
Think of it as a forecast. It's also a complex task in which the relationships between cause and effect are not tightly bound or well understood. Don't believe me? Ask yourself this. Do the legions of motivational speakers, influencers, consultants, and corporate coaches that comprise the multi-billion dollar global leadership industry exist because we figured out leadership? Or because we haven't? So what do we know about forecasting answers to complex questions? For that, we have to turn the clock way back to 1906 and take a look at a guy named Francis. And a cow. Francis was Sir Francis Galton, a prolific British scientist who made big contributions to a wide range of academic disciplines over the course of his life. One area of research was eugenics. That was a term he coined, which denoted a branch of study dedicated to the superiority of a minority class of human elites and their exploitation as breeding stock to improve the homo sapien herd. The cow was actually an ox, and that ox was an unfortunate participant in a contest underway at a livestock fair, one brisk autumn morning, in which attendees were invited to examine the corralled beast bound for slaughter and, in exchange for a meager sum, purchase a ticket and inscribe on it their estimate of the weight of the soon-to-be-departed once it was dispatched and dressed for sale. The contestant with the best guess would win a prize. Galton's eugenic perspective left him dubious as to the efficacy of the democratic process, specifically with regard to a commoner's capacity to make good voting decisions about important government issues. The contest, Galton figured, was a reasonable proxy for simpleton suffrage. So as an experiment, he grabbed all the discarded tickets at the end of the contest and did the math. Now, you can imagine a smug, self-satisfied grin on his face, when he noted that all the contestants weren't just wrong, they were really wrong. But that elation was fleeting, because once the responses were averaged, he was forced to acknowledge a professionally inconvenient truth. The aggregated wisdom of the crowd was nearly perfect. The ox weighed 1,198 pounds. The morons guessed 1,197. How did they do it? Just like leadership selection, the question of an ox's weight is actually complex, and the answer depends on a really broad range of independent factors, so that no single person could possess enough information to make an accurate guess. But, as the number of contestants increases, so too does the small scraps of useful information that each one contributes with their guess. Valid information increasingly coalesces around the correct answer, while invalid information, or just wild guesses above or below the mark, cancel each other out when the collective wisdom of the crowd is aggregated and averaged. You can actually experience the exact same effect by slipping on a pair of noise-canceling headphones and flipping the switch. The bottom line is that when it comes to answering complex questions, a large, diverse group of forecasters will outperform individual experts or small groups of experts over time. So we know that in the long run, betting on the group will produce better outcomes. The question is, what kind of group will produce the best outcomes? For that, we'll run the clock forward to about 2010, when the Iraq intelligence failure and countless others preceding it prompted the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, or IARPA, of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to explore the limits of accurately predicting extremely complex future events. The government commissioned five university teams to compete against a IARPA control team in a forecasting tournament to discover which team was the most accurate, and more important, why. Each team was tasked with using nothing but publicly available data to produce probability estimates to questions typically entrusted to U.S. intelligence analysts. Designing the methodology to answer those questions was left to the discretion of each team. Building on Galton's findings, Dr. Philip Tetlock and a group of fellow researchers from the University of Pennsylvania placed wanted ads in several periodicals to recruit a crowdsourced team of more than 2,800 unpaid volunteers from the public. They dubbed their team the Good Judgment Project. Over the course of four years, 
Tetlock's team provided more than 1 million predictions in response to roughly 500 IARPA questions. Throughout the tournament, Tetlock ran a constant series of internal control group experiments to determine which specific factors or manipulations resulted in improved accuracy. Combining the components that were found to be most effective allowed Tetlock's team to draw a blueprint for a motor that produced forecasts that were far superior to those produced by any other competitor during the tournament. At the end of the first year, Tetlock beat IARPA by 60%. The next year, that number rose to 78 In fact, at the end of the second year, Tetlock was so far ahead of the other university teams that IARPA fired them and just went head-to-head. Their winning margins continued to increase for each of the two remaining years, and at the end of the tournament, they were the undisputed champions. Over the course of the entire tournament, the Good Judgment Project provided correct answers to extremely complex questions over 86% of the time. Even more astonishing, a journalist later leaked a secret report which revealed that Tetlock's volunteer team of nobodies, armed just with Google, actually beat a previously undisclosed shadow team of analytic professionals from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, who were armed with classified information, by 30%. The government's best minds, powered by the government's best information, were paddling in Tetlock's wake. The motor that drove that victorious vessel was a methodology called superforecasting, and it was constructed with a completely replicable combination of components. Let's take a second and recap the story so far. DHS had a leadership problem, and the U.S. intelligence community had an analysis problem. Both groups had the same goal, make the best possible predictions about complex future events using imperfect information. And both had the same fundamental design flaws related to structure and measurement. The superforecasting solution wasn't perfect, but it was far better than the intelligence community's status quo. Those factors collectively suggested a novel question. Could an organization use a superforecasting methodology to improve the accuracy of its leadership selection process in the same way that the Good Judgment Project used it to improve intelligence estimates? That prospect made my fingers itch. The independent literatures for superforecasting, complexity theory, judgment and decision making, and leadership are all really well charted and explored, but that small area where they overlap was completely dark, and that's where I wanted to go. My challenge was getting there. There weren't any published case studies to meta analyze. A valid case study would take years and hundreds of participants, and I couldn't construct a valid statistical model for human predictions. Since conventional research methods were either impractical or impossible, I decided to build an unconventional conveyance in the form of a Gedankenfahrung, or thought experiment. They used subjunctive reasoning to conceptually test an otherwise untestable hypothesis by imagining a set of conditions intended to answer the question, what would happen if... The model I imagined was of a large American university in the midst of a hiring initiative for new professors. I tried a bunch of different models, but I finally settled on a university because it's instantly relatable and classrooms are reasonably static environments with measurable outputs. Also, university professors are pretty good proxies for leaders. They stimulate learning and engagement, they provide vision, articulate goals, Organize collective effort, drive performance, and reward achievement. That sounds like a leader to me. It was an optimal place for a test. So, I tore the university's conventional hiring process out of the frame, and I bolted Tetlock's super forecasting motor in its place. I fueled it with conjured candidates, turned the key, and watched to see what would happen. While the motor was running, I turned loose a red team of wrench-bearing monkeys to probe for weakness and foul the gears. They proved to be annoyingly shrewd simians. So what did I learn? I set out on this expedition to answer a question. Could superforecasting deliver better leaders in the same way that it delivered better intelligence analysis? I genuinely believe that it could. I was wrong. It doesn't work for leadership selection, at at least not part and parcel in a way that's generalizable. But the question wasn't asked in vain. I did learn a lot. 
I found systemic and largely overlooked flaws in the process we use to choose our leaders. Super forecasting might not be a perfect fit, but now that I understood how the component pieces worked and why, I could disassemble that motor and show organizations how the individual parts could be used to make them better. I could also draw a map that others, like you, could hopefully follow and build on. Those are acceptable results. My thesis was a failure, and I couldn't be happier. I'll summarize a few of those recommendations here, but you can find a complete list on the CHDS website. I'm also including a slide with some links to things that helped me along the way. So here's a few of the recommendations. Some of these will make more sense within the context of the thesis. To date, organizations have exerted tremendous resources and effort to essentially chase an errant group of horses around a pasture they never should have been in. They should stop running and build a better barn door. Some leadership candidates are better than others, so even modest improvements to the predictive accuracy of the selection process can pay big dividends. Organizations should disabuse themselves of the notion that experts can intuitively identify good leaders when they see them. They absolutely cannot. The moment that any expert successfully solves the cause-effect selection puzzle in a manner that's replicable and reliable, the multi-billion dollar leadership industry will cease to exist. Until then, leadership selection remains a complex task for which experts are ill-suited. A large, cognitively diverse group of trained selection officials will produce better outcomes over time than a small, homogenous group of experts. Organizations should make the system for evaluating leadership candidates a blind process by anonymizing application materials to remove any biographic indicators. There's no predictive value to be found in a candidate's name, gender, race, ethnicity, or whatever. Allowing evaluators to have access to that data is an invitation for bad judgment. Prior to a final selection decision, officials should be judging the future performance potential of multiple barcodes rather than multiple people. Candidates for first-line leadership positions should be evaluated based on their capacity to perform the job they're competing for, not the job they currently have. Past performance only predicts future performance within solitary domains. Contributing to an effective team and leading an effective team are different outcomes requiring different proficiencies. Measuring technical proficiency is easy. Easy doesn't equal effective. Organizations should radically alter the way they interview candidates for leadership positions by adopting a moneyball methodology. Officials tasked with evaluating candidates should never have an opportunity to see or hear any candidate. Structured interviews should be conducted by a panel of trained interviewers whose sole task is the elicitation of the best possible information from a candidate in a valid, reliable manner. Anonymized interview transcripts can then be digitally distributed to train selection officials for blind evaluations. Tasking one group of people with conducting and evaluating interviews is a recipe for poor judgment. In addition to anonymizing all selection packets to remove biographic information, the packets for every candidate should also be chunked into logical portions and randomized prior to evaluation. Chunking will mitigate the halo effect, or the unconscious tendency for positive or negative impressions formed by a rater in one area to unjustly influence the rating of an unrelated area. Organizations should use multiple tools to evaluate the performance potential of leadership candidates. Combining multiple forecasts for a single event increases their predictive accuracy when they're aggregated and averaged. Selection processes that only use one or two data sources, like a resume and an interview, are inherently less accurate. Organizations have got to refine the way they conceptualize diversity. If pressed, many who insist that diverse groups are better than homogenous groups probably couldn't explain why because touting diversity is a socially acceptable thing to do. Diversity isn't a polite abstraction. It's a silver bullet. Diversity is a tangible, game-changing force that can radically improve the performance of a group in the same way that a fulcrum can radically improve the performance of a lever. In order to function optimally, a group needs to be cognitively diverse, yet most organizations strive for biographic diversity. That's a myopic perspective that hampers potential. 
Biographic diversity is a valid path to cognitive diversity, but there are others. When forming groups to work in complex problem spaces, organizations should strive for cognitive diversity. Organizations also need to understand the systemic reasons why groups of complex problem solvers succeed or fail. Groups can work collaboratively to produce judgments that are far more accurate than the best estimate of any single member, but only under very specific conditions. Diversity, training, feedback, individual accountability, recognition, and algorithms are all critical components for effective crowdsourcing because of their collective capacity to filter static, amplify signal, and progressively improve over time. Conversely, groups of otherwise incomparably intelligent problem solvers can produce judgments that are far worse than those of any single member if they're left untrained, unaccountable, homogenous, consensus-driven, and without effective feedback. When randomly wrong becomes consistently wrong, aggregating and averaging doesn't filter the static. It amplifies it. Decision-making is a continuum, not an instant event and a group that can't learn from its mistakes is going to repeat them. Organizations need to understand the difference between complex and complicated problem spaces as a means of finding the best path to a solution. If the relationship between cause and effect is observable and replicable, then using a diverse group to find a solution is inefficient. Machines or experts would produce better results. But if the problem space is complex, Diversity will beat the pants off expertise. The last thing I'd say is be wary of labels. Too often, people are anointed with the title of expert simply because they've been working in a particular field for a long time. Experience and expertise are not the same thing, and it's a critical distinction. Long-term performance does not equal aptitude. Thanks for listening. I hope it was enough to make you curious.